Hello and welcome to another magical Saturday stream. I am your host, Joe Magician, and today we're going to be going back to the well, I guess? The Damon Blackfire well, that is. Previous live stream, we had talked about Damon's young life and the factors around him that had created this weird nexus of problems and power that have to do with what became his eventual rebellion, but specifically as a young man, as Damon Waters, all the, and it ends up just being like this long drama of Kings behaving badly and Damon eventually, you know, sort of absorbing all those problems into one person. But today we're going to talk about specifically Damon Blackfire. After he got the sword, after he was given basically his own house, and we're going to go right up to the start of the rebellion today. Um, yeah, get, get ready for that stuff. Well, the rebellion itself is, again, such a big topic that it would be kind of pushing it all together very, very quickly and way too much bad summary to try and do it all. But yeah, that's what we're doing today. Uh, how is the sound today? Hopefully good. I'm hoping it's good. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, Austin Lewis, Egret K2, Edward Martin, uh, <laughs> Magic Man, get it poppin', yeah. Uh, Grey Waste Tim, go to your in-laws to see their new puppy. That is a worthy cause. Puppies are always good. Uh, Grey Waste Tim also left a good comment on, um, on my Twitter DMs, a question about Damon. That is very much in line with what we're going to talk about today. So get ready for that stuff. Um, always see the puppies. It's always a good thing. So before uh, we really get going, just got some random promo stuff to get out of the way. Um, as always, if you make sure you like and subscribe and do all those things, and there's a good reason for that today. We're gonna be given because it's almost Christmas, um, and I'm feeling especially jolly. We'll be giving away some codes for. Um, Giving away some codes, basically, for uh, that will effectively get you a free T-shirt from my Threadless shop. But it's it's real. It's just a um, the details are unimportant. But it would it would effectively get you a free T-shirt, more or less. I think you have to pay for shipping, but that's probably about it. Um, so rather than doing hat stuff today, I think we'll do that, and we're gonna make them real easy. <laughs> I want to make sure we give some of these away. Um, so let's see here we got 56 viewers right now and 34 likes so we get to 50 likes and uh i will pick somebody random from the chat and i will you can contact me afterwards and we'll give away a code so let's do it every 25 likes okay so 50 75 100 125 150 all that stuff we'll just Go on up, just make sure you slam that like button, get that number up, and you, you too, can get some. Hang on a second. <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a little bit more, but you too can get your very own ass waffle. Or waffle gear. <laughs> or the Joe Magician stuff. Um, basically, whatever, whatever's in the shop that catches your fancy. Some people have like mugs and stuff like that. There are leggings. Actually, somebody in the comments on my last stream asked what the ass waffle thing was. They didn't really get it. Um, so it's essentially, if you try and say a song of ice and fire, so the acronym is A-S-O-I-A-F. What if you tried to say that as a word? Uh, this was a thing from Baster Monthly, and we decided to pronounce it as asswaf. And it's... <laughs> As we're ridiculous, we ended up saying like, well, that's kind of close to ass waffle. So people who are fans of ass waffle are ass waffles. And uh, very common on the internet for the peach emoji to stand in for uh, a butt. <laughs> you see somebody put a butt on your butt emoticon. So there you go. So you have peach for the butt and waffle, a literal waffle, you know, the breakfast good for... <laughs> It's waffle. <laughs> it is a binky. It is a very comfortable thing. Oh, 50 likes. Um, 
Oh shoot, I probably I think I still have that bot. Um Let me see if I could do this. Um Okay, so let me see if I can do this. Hang on a second. <laughs> Ass waffle leggings. Peach waffle. I'm sure they taste pretty good on their own. Just having peach and waffles. But yeah, that's the joke. Uh, so 55 likes. Let's see if we can do this. Nightbot is in the chat. Or it should be. Um, let me make sure. It is in the chat. All right, let's try this. Come on, Nightbot. Did it work? There you go. It worked. Way to go, Nightbot. <laughs> um, is Sanri here? Yes, she is. Mallory just showed up in the chat. This was actually her suggestion. She wanted to do a stream on um, Demon Blackfire specifically for a very special someone that uh, of hers that is a big fan of Damon. And I thought it was a good idea, so that's why we're doing it. There you go, buddy. Um, so, Edward Martin. Uh, I guess um, message me on Twitter or email me or something like that, and I will give you a code uh, so that you can go to my Threadless shop and buy something for free, basically. it's I think it's like, I forget how much money it is. It's like $15 or $17 off. So it basically pays for one free t-shirt. I'll go ahead and send you that. And if you don't want it, um, just say in the chat that you don't and I'll pick somebody else. But thanks guys for slamming that MF and like button. I don't know what subscription status private means, but I'm pretty sure you have to be subscribed to be chatting, so. Um, happy to be here and talk about Damon. Oh, we're going to talk a lot about Damon. Uh, I also wanted to say uh, thanks to Maura Lee. Before the stream started, she sent $50. As always, Maura is the MVP. Um, and she sent a message. Here is wishing you and all your loved ones happy holidays and a very happy New Year's. Thank you for all the fabulous content you've provided for us viewers and patrons this past year. Looking forward to all the content in 2022. You are loved. Thank you, Mar. She is, she sends very nice messages, even when she's not attaching money to it. Um, she sends them on Patreon all the time. Um, oh, and there was a... Danny McKay sent $5 for his usual... Happy Saturday streams. Thank you, buddy. Um, and, as, and speaking of, if you want to support me, you can always go to patreon.com slash Joe Magician. Um, at the $5 level, you get access to all the patron-only content, uh, like the Dying of the Light read through, some past uh, podcasts about like George R. Martin's other uh, previous stories, Dying of the Light is his first book he ever read he ever wrote um like beat house man and uh what was the other one hang on a second <laughs> sand kings i did one on sand kings and there's a few others and it gets you um stuff early and all that other kind of stuff Oh, there was also one from Ruino Zamfir. i don't know where it went i saw it before we went live it was um Roughly, I think, $20. And there was a message attached to it, but apparently YouTube has decided that I don't get to see that anymore. But thank you, Ramona, for sending that through. Um, so, yeah. So, thank you to all my all the patrons and uh, all the fun, fun stuff we get up to, especially in the Slack. People were... Uh, There's a lot of um there was a lot of silliness recently about who eat ducks, if you don't know what those are. 
that's how it goes. Um, yeah, let's get the old game in Blackfire stuff. Oh, Fever Dream. Uh, I think Nauticast did Fever Dream. I have not read that one, but I, I know the gist of what it's about. It's a very different George R. R. Martin book. Um, I have not covered it. Um, I think I have some other stuff I want to do after I finish Dying of the Light first. Like, I want to catch up on The Witcher. I've got the Wheel of Time book. I me unread at some point. I want to go through more of the Expanse, but um, I'll come back around to more firm stuff in the future. Have I read the Wheel of Time now? I have the first book. My my normal MO for new series is I just buy the first one, and then from there I read it and decide if I want to keep going with it. So I have a whole bunch of like the first books of series sitting on my shelves. Um, got the first Maurice Drew on. I've got the uh, the Iron. Obviously, Wheel of Time. Uh, the first, the Dragon Bone Chair, Memory Sorrow and Thorn from Tad Williams. A whole bunch of stuff like that. So, um, I have not seen The Witcher Season 2. I know it came out the other day. I have not binged it. Uh, I'm most of the way through the book anyway, Blood of Elves. I wanted to finish that before I went ahead and read it. But, um, So yeah. All right, so I think it's about time we did uh went ahead and went full Dame in Blackfire mode. Uh opening quote here. Again, this is from you Sir Eustace Osgray. This is where we get a lot of the information about Damon as a character. It came from the Sworn Sword, and we hear from the side of a Damon loyalist, in this case, uh Sir Eustace. It's going crazy right now. Get down. Okay, I guess this is not happening. <laughs> um, it explains why women die in birth so often when having dragon babies. That's curious. I know Fever Dream is about. Huh. Interesting to know. Um, yeah, so here we go. From, from Sir Eustace himself, the original Blackfire loyalist lover of Damon, he said, So they did. The rightful king, Damon Blackfire, the king who bore the sword. The old man's mustache quivered. The men of the Red Dragon called them lo called themselves the loyalists. But we who chose the black were just as loyal once, though now all men who march beside me to seat Prince Damon on the Iron Throne have melted away like morning dew. Mayhaps I dream them, or more like Lord Bloodraven and his raven's teeth have put the fear in them. They cannot all be dead. What you'll notice, what I love about this quote is, um, and this is sort of a running theme for Damon as a potential king of Westeros, is that there's not a lot to be said about what exactly he would do better as a king, um, or what Daron did wrong. What 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 exactly are they trying to fix about Westeros by putting Damon on the Iron Throne? It largely comes down to uh he was cool and he was handsome and he looked like a warrior and he had a cool sword um for characters that talk about him that's sort of what you see but george has introduced quite a lot of backstory and depth to the to the uh the coalition o damon i guess as you would call it you know why were different people pushing him to do this why he in particular himself ended up rebelling against uh king daron the second Ends up being interesting as we see quite a few other Targaryen uh, Civil War claimants coming to the forefront in A Song of Ice and Fire. You know, you get Daenerys, you get young Griff, perhaps Jon at some point, or at least perhaps the temptation for it. Um, it all ends up working together in an interesting way. And it really does make the point that it's rarely one person, one cause. There's always something else behind it. Um, actually, someone made a comparison in the comments of the last one to the Baratheon brothers, and I think that makes a, a good point about Damon and his cause of war. Um, uh, 
Uh, so let, let's start off here. I think the first the first thing I want to talk about was kind of the comparisons to the Dance of the Dragons and sort of a quick summary of what we talked about in the last stream. So when we last sound cut out, I think it's fine to me. Um, Annabelle's having a problem? Did I just stop making noise for anybody else? Is there anything to fix, though? The moment Aegon V tried to change anything, he faced a lot of backlash. Seems like the people in charge of Westeros is one strong people in charge. That is sort of part of it. Um, there, there is a quite a lot of not particularly daemon related reasons that they wanted Daron off the... Oh, when I cut out? Okay. Um, okay. Going to turn up the output a little bit. Um, the gains... Whatever. I just won't lean back. We'll, we'll just you know, point this right at my face. Doesn't look like I'm redlining. All right, there we go. Okay. Um, so we left off in the last stream with Damon Waters becoming Damon Blackfire after being given the sword Blackfire from his father, King Aegon IV, otherwise known as the unworthy. Well, supposed father. There's a lot of uh, questions about who exactly is a Aegon's children. Um, Some of them are clear, some of them are less clear. And that sort of is a larger point about the conflict between Damon and Daron as characters. There's consternation over who was the real heir to Aegon, largely because Aegon created a lot of that consternation himself. He thought that Daron was actually his brother, Aemon, Aemon the Dragon Knight's uh, actual son. Therefore, if Daron was not his son, then his true heir would be Daemon, who um, he fathered in the main vault, apparently. Snuck in there like Lan the Clever. Um, and a lot of what, what goes on here is because of that. It's that there's no way that Daemon Blackfire would ever be the heir over Daron on Legitimized or not, uh, because Daron is much older. He's the firstborn son. There's a lot of discussion about uh, which child comes first, male versus female, all these other kind of things. But this is one of the most clear cut, clear cut succession things you will ever see. If they are both legitimate, Daron has to come before Damon. There would have to be some big reason for him not to be. Um, Tarks left the name Damon. It's almost like George uses that name in particular ways to signal that a character is about to fuck sh some shit up. There's been no Damons that are just like doing okay. <laughs> Characters named Damon, it's like Magor. Things things are popping off. Um So yeah, that that is a lot of the conflict. But Aegon himself did not openly defy Daron's right to succeed. He died with, even though he went ahead and he put his will that all of his bastards, his many, 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 many bastards, some say as many as like 20, maybe more. It's hard to say because he was extremely sexually active as a king. That was sort of his thing. Um, as he died... His will declared all of his bastards, big and small, to be legitimate. But it did not disinherit Daron. There was definitely an idea within people at the time that his decision to deny Daron the sort of Blackfire, the, the sort of kings as it was known, was sort of a stealth uh, succession marker. And even though his will didn't say that Daron, the sword was a will in itself. Uh, we talked about that a lot last stream, and I just sort of slapped it around. I don't, I don't think it's true. It's largely um, a political ploy being made so that um, to find a reason for Damon to be legitimate over Daron. That's largely what it was. It doesn't really mean that. 
doesn't seem like it was in Egan's character to essentially be that subtle. He just... The explanation comes the best from Egg, where he says that his father said that Daron was a... Daron wasn't a warrior, and Damon was, so why would you give a guy who's not the warrior a sword? That kind of thing. <laughs> name Damon for Targs. It's like the name Dagon for the Ironborn. Is that trouble? Yeah, definitely. So, Aegon IV dies. Daron ascends to the Iron Throne. All the other bastards are legitimate, but all still behind Daron, and that's sort of where it stands. When we hear about Damon as a character and what's good about him, this is going to be important. They largely focus on his aesthetics, his good nature, and his ability to charm people, and that he had a lot of physical prowess. You know, he was a great warrior. He was good with a sword. He could beat people in tourneys. And that's kind of all we know about him that is good. None of those are qualities that make you a good head of state, except for the charm part. That he's very good at making friends, that people naturally like him. That is something that makes you a good, um, that can get you popularity, but the, that's not, you need more than that. You need to be more than likable to be an effective head of state, like a king. And that's one of those things that George does, and it's kind of a fun thing you can see for like backhanded co compliments effectively, where the things being left out sort of tell you a little bit about them. So, the idea is that Damon himself is perhaps a little bit of a jock, a little bit of a bro. Um, not not particularly said to be particularly intelligent nor politically savvy. Um, is he knowledgeable of the law, about money? Is he good at creating a lot of alliances um, that people don't hand to him? No, it, it doesn't really seem that way. Sur surely people uh, go for him for the Blackfire Rebellion that he eventually starts, or is started, that he happens to be a part of. But um, it's not like you see Damon as a character going up and down like Western Essos finding allies. It doesn't really seem like that he's going out and being a statesman. He just seems... A, a really good lordling, I guess you would say, or kind of like a knight of summer. Um, stop by and hit the MF and like button since I cannot listen live today. Have a good stream. Oh, thank you, Tanya. Um, a guilty undertaker. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way. We're doing the uh, giveaways today, so we get to 75 likes. You guys slam the like button. We're going to give away another one. Edward Martin already uh, got one. Just has to send me a message after the stream. Or right, you can send it now, and I'll get to it after the stream. Send my code. You can get something from my Threatless shop. But anyway, um, yeah, slam that MF and like button. Um, he did start minting his own currency when the rebellion started, so I wouldn't say he's not intelligent by any means. I'm not saying he's as dumb as a rock. I'm not saying he's, um, you know, literally um, Victorian Greyjoy. But it's not one of his strengths. That's not something people talk about with him. I think that that's the point I'm making. Not as intelligent as Daron. Yes, Stefan. I think that's definitely... They, they are contrasting characters, deliberately so by George. Um... And if this description sounds perhaps a little bit like somebody else from A Song of Ice and Fire, um, talking about Robert Baratheon, um, Harry the Heir from the Vale, um, or actually Ramon in the chat just said Friendly Baratheon, you are correct. This is largely the descriptions we get of why people like Robert, why people like Harry, why people like Renly. It's It's good guy. He's... He's tough and he's strong. He can beat people in combat. He's personable, and that's kind of what you get about Damon. Definitely, like uh, we hear about Robert. Robert, as a young man, gets almost the exact same descriptions as Damon does, where he's everybody's best friend. He'll go drinking with anybody. He can beat anybody down in the tourney ring. He's got his war hammer. He's really impressive. That's largely what we get about Damon. Um, and this is actually how 
George described them to the artist um, Amok. If you look at the Song of Ice and Fire wiki, for a lot of older characters, there's these very similar looking, very stylistically similar portraits of a lot of characters. And if you follow them, it goes to some guy in Russia named Amok. And George, in the past, gave him a lot of like personal descriptions of what these characters looked like, and then he drew them. So in a lot of cases, you can look at the official art from like calendars in the world book, but um, George gave extremely specific descriptions for all these characters. Um, and he gave one here for Damon Blackfire because he wanted portraits of them made. Damon Blackfire and Bittersteel, a.k.a. Agor Rivers, are both bastard sons of King Aegon IV, the unworthy, although Damon is a targ on both sides, while Bittersteel's mother was a bracken. Blood Raven is also the king's bastard by yet another mo mother. Uh, at the time of Red Grassfield, Damon Blackfire was 26, and his twin sons, Aegon and Aemon, who squired for him, were 12. Bittersteel was 24, and Blood Raven 21. This is about 13 years before the Hedge Knight. Damon was very much a Targaryen, albeit bastard-born. He had silver-gold hair, purple eyes. He looked heroic. Tall, muscular, handsome, wide shoulders, flat stomach. They're all descriptions of Robert, except for the hair color and the eyes. A great warrior, uh, clean-shaven, wears his hair long like Marvel's Thor. Can be charming, charismatic, too, with a winning smile. He used the arms of House Targaryen on his battle standards, but with the, cover with the colors reversed a black three-headed dragon on a red field. He'd bear the same sigil on his shield. I can imagine him in gorgeous, ornate plate armor, red and black, black dragon wings sprouting from his helm. So that's kind of what you're getting here. Um, it, it's, it's like the Targaryen version of Robert Baratheon as a young man. That's sort of what Damon was like. Um, oh, hey, Lady Shar. Good to see you. Can't stay. Stop by to... Say hi and uh, hit the like button. Well, stick around for a second because we just hit 75 likes. Nightbot, let's pick another winner. Who else is going to get a uh, a free code for um for my threadless shop? Let's roll that dice. Hey, AK, how's it going? All right, Nightbot, do your magic. Christina uh, Kido. <laughs> there you go. Uh, if you want to send me a message on uh, on my on my email at askwithjoemagician at gmail.com or you can send me like a DM on Twitter or wherever, I will send you a code after the stream ends and you can get yourself a th something free from my Threadless shop. So there you go. Um, thanks, guys, for slamming the like button, especially Lady Shar showing up and pushing it over in AK. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the that's really good framing for Damon at this time. Um, Damon is somewhere between Renly and Robert, maybe leaning more towards Renly. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that name. I tried. Uh, I did. I did not get it. I think there's. Uh, there's sort of a comparison that I think people would want to make Stannis the comp for Damon, but it doesn't really seem like they have much similar in character. Um, Daron and Stannis might be closer. <laughs> so one thing that's important if you're talking about House of the Dragon and the Dance of the Dragons it is based on is sort of the time frame that goes on here. You know, Aegon IV dies when Daemon is 13 years old. He's legitimized. He becomes Daemon Blackfire. But there was not instantly a civil war. This is not a boy king going to war. It's a long simmering conflict that had been managed by King Daron II. But eventually blew up for perhaps schemey reasons. Um, and the reason for it is far far more complex than is often presented especially when you hear about it from characters in a song of ice and fire those far removed from the black fire rebellions they tend to assign very simple reasons for the rebellion that have to do largely with a broken heart you know kind of if you're thinking about again if you want to make the comp of robert to damon um there is a very simplistic way of thinking about robert's rebellion that it was about liana and that's sort of the framing that damon gets a lot where Damon's like, well, he did it for Daenerys. No, 
it was definitely a part of it. That was a big reason for it, but there was a lot more for his anger in particular and the forces that pushed the realm to war. Um, <laughs> much more bitter steel than blood raven I'm, i think it was both i mean we're gonna get to that um bitter steel probably yes yeah, stannis and bitter steel probably have a lot in common too um Patrick, dude. stannis has no charisma Dar daron does not have a ton of charisma either but um yeah bitter steel yeah it's probably a good call bitter steel and stannis might be closer oh it'd be fun the two of them team up and I actually staged a successful rebellion. Who would have known? It's almost like that's sort of the point of Renly and Stannis is that had they worked together. Anyway, we're not doing this today. We're not doing, we're not doing Renly and Stannis. This is a sort of a general framing. If you're not familiar with Damon, think young Robert Baratheon. That's, pr that's pretty close. Somewhere between Robert and, and, and uh, Renly. So let's pick up where we left off. So specifically we left off with the death of Aegon IV, the unworthy. He legitimized everybody, but Daron, his son, his older son, his first son, is, takes the Iron Throne without conflict. He is crowned. He actually takes Aegon IV's crown and wears it instead of wearing um, any of the others that are laying around. At this point, uh, Aegon the Conqueror is gone, but there are plenty of others. You, he could have worn uh, Aenys... Is he could have worn Jaehaerys, um, maybe here would have had their own crown at that point. Viser uh, Viserys' crown probably been uh, still been around. Oh, I think that was the same as Jaehaerys's. Anyways, but he takes Aegon's because he needs legitimacy. He's aware that people think that he's a bastard. He's aware that people like other candidates for the Iron Throne, even though that he took it. With um with no problem. Because it's not like the whispers stop just because you're sitting on the Iron Throne. It actually kind of highlights it. And there's a lot of people at the time of his ascension that were kind of nudging Damon to do something about it, but Damon declines. Uh, Damon does not rebel for another 12 years after this. <laughs> um so when Daron takes the throne, he is the polar opposite of Aegon IV. He is seen as dutiful, uh, lawful, intelligent, pretty good at politics on a macro scale, maybe not on an individual scale. And he seems to be particularly good at ruling, like not in a, um, like specifically in a administrative, like a managerial way. He seems to, for some reason, despite Aegon being the worst example, Daron has shown up on the Iron Throne ready to do the job that he's been preparing for it for a long time. He hasn't been just sitting at court and going to tourneys and that stuff. He wants to be a good king. And he has apparently put in the work behind the scenes to do it. And I think if you look at it this way, you can maybe make the case that the reason that Aegon the Force administration in his reign did not literally implode is that Daron behind the scenes was probably keeping things together. That um, he's the one soothing egos. He's the one making sure that like the realm keeps working. Especially because when you're talking about Aegon the Fourth's Hands of the Kings, they are fast and furious. They come and go pretty fast. And they're largely based on who is sucking up the egg on the most rather than who's actually good at the job. Um, it's, pr it's very likely that it was not Aegon and probably not the hand of the king either, but probably Prince Daron that was the real power behind the throne. But he would have been limited, of course. He can't outright, you know, defy Aegon's wishes. If he wants to make somebody hand of the king, he can't really undo it. But he can do back, he can do politicking, he can do managerial stuff, administrative stuff to make sure that they can't screw up everything too badly. Um, yes, yeah, surprise, he was competent. Uh, Dorian Dame says, Darren, watch Aegon the Fourth like Sansa do, so is she learning not <laughs> what not to do. Yeah, that could, that could have been something about it. Um, So 
So I, I think there's a good chance here that Daron was the pseudo or shadow king of the West of Westeros while Aegon was in charge, doing his best to make sure it literally did not collapse under the weight of Aegon's misrule so that he could ascend eventually. And this is one of the reasons that actually people think that there may be a conspiracy about Aegon's death, that uh, he so quickly managed to die and that it worked out so well for Daron is that maybe he was tired of Aegon being a dick and especially trying to disinherit him and spreading these rumors. But long story short, um, <clears throat> he really seems like a kind of like a John Aaron or a Ned Stark role. Like in particular, when you look at A Song of Ice and Fire, when Robert is off um, hunting for boars and having fun in the forest, Ned's the one that is left behind to sit on the throne and administer the problems that come up to the throne. Um, now he is handed the king, but it, it it seems like that's probably the relationship going on here. Yes, please slam the like button. And 15 more people slam the like button. Somebody else is getting a t-shirt from my thirdless shop. This is one of those things that I like about when the Blackfire Rebellions and something that doesn't, I don't think it's talked about enough, is that there are clear parallels to the main story. That it's not just a Blackfire Targ story on its own. It has resonance for the story that we know. Um, that the characters resemble what we already know. And they're like different takes on them, that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, Guilty Honor Case sa says it helped that Daron had his own better version of Damon Blackfire and Bayonne Breaks here. That too. Um, it's like not the hand of the king, but like the wrist of the king, I guess. Yeah, that's right, AK. Uh, two people have forgotten Edward Martin and Christina. Name I'm not going to pronounce because I'm going to get it wrong. So Daron takes the Iron Throne. Um... <laughs> And there is a big list of crises that have to be dealt with immediately. The first of which is Aegon's will. Aegon on his death, as we talked about, legitimized all his bastards. So there are four really big problems that come out of this. We have Bl Brynden Rivers, a.k.a. Blood Raven, Aegor Rivers, a.k.a. Bitter Steel, Damon Blackfire, of course, and then there's also Shira Seastar. Um, she's not seen as a direct threat to the throne itself, um, largely because of Westerosi misogyny, but she is one of the quote-unquote great bastards. She's powerful at court. Um, her whims, essentially, on which of the great bastards she decides to romance is one of the key factors in driving a wedge between them and creating a rivalry. Um, she, that kind of thing. So he can't ignore Shiera. It, she is one of the great bastards. Her legitimization is a problem especially if it would create a any child of hers would end up having a claim to the iron throne although it would be further down but let's say for instance that she had a child with daemon or she had a child with uh blood raven or bitter steel there's a real chance that all these great bastards will eventually all have children all of whom have claims to the iron throne and one of them decide hey you know what fuck them we're going for the iron throne so they have to um he has to deal with this. This is a real problem. So what does da what does Daron do upon taking the Iron Throne? Well, the first thing he does is makes I'm not sure if Blood Raven's his official spy master, but he more or less functions as it. Blood Raven and Daron essentially become peas in a pod, at least from a realm perspective. We know later in the Blackfire Rebellions that Blood Raven stays on his side, but it seems that way from the very beginning that um, Daron has Blood Raven's loyalty. It seems largely by continuing his place at court, by being the spy master guy and letting him keep his own personal army. Blood Raven has the Raven's teeth. Think of how messed up that is, that there's a guy in King's Landing that has a personal army. Or he's a, well, actually, he's pretty young at this point, so he would have been like 12. Um, but over the course of Daron's rule, he does allow the, the Raven's teeth to become formed. So he largely uh, acquiesces the Blood Raven. And Blood Raven doesn't ask a lot. He's not asking for lands. He's not asking for titles. He doesn't want him. He doesn't apparently doesn't want Daron to force Shira to marry him. Um, he just wants to sort of keep what he's doing and eventually create the Raven's teeth. Daron's like, good, sorted. Um, 
GRC stars one of the leading candidates to be Quaith, isn't she? That's certainly uh, theories I've heard. Um, I think the one I like best is that she's the mother of, Mel uh, of Melisandre. That's the theory I like best about. Uh, that's from Yoke Boy on Radio Westeros called Melanie Seastar. I think that's how it goes. Um, <clears throat> I also hope we see a lot more from Shira. She seems like a great character. Um, Duncan Egg would be the most likely place for her to show up. She has not shown up at anything. So um, a conflict between Bloodraven and Bittersteel at some point or something involving the Brackens and the Blackwoods would be most likely case for Lady Shiera to show up. But anyway, um, so Blood Rain sorted. He is loyal to Daron. He stays that way his whole life. Apparently, Daron just said, What do you want, Blood Raven? and then said yes to them. Bitter Steel is less so. Bitter Steel is, well, his name, the fact that he's bitter, is kind of the tell here. He's ambitious. He wants Daron's seat. He wants to be King of Westeros. He has a bad temperament. He's largely a bully. A um, bit of an asshole, and not a lot of people like old Bittersteel, and especially Bittersteel does not like Daron. But those sort of things work against Bittersteel. He is largely disliked and has trouble finding allies, so even though he's quote-unquote a great bastard, he on his own is not a particular threat to the Iron Throne. Um, he would have the Brackens, and that might be it. It's not even clear that he has a good relationship to the Brackens, uh, his actual, his mother's family. So Daron doesn't do a lot with Bittersteel. He's not given position. He's allowed to stay at court, but I don't think he's given, in he may be given incomes. I think that was one of the consolations for Daron is he made sure that they were given um, you know, money to maintain their lifestyle, but that's kind of it. He's not given, not really given anything. And it's seen as a sort of who cares sort of thing. It's like, uh, actually, Stannis is probably a better comparison here. It's just like, well, what's he going to do? He, if he doesn't have lands and he doesn't have vassals and he doesn't have soldiers, then there's, there's only so much mischief he can get up to. So that's kind of one Daron's mistakes. He does not really manage bitter steel particularly well. Um, just kind of an asshole. <laughs> yes, hit that like button for a free shirt from my Threadless shop. So then we get to Damon, Damon Blackfire. Now, at this point, he has Blackfire. He's 13 years old, though. Um, some people are taking the sword as a pseudo will, saying, Damon, you need to rebel. Take what is yours. Your father wanted you to have it. And Damon is largely set up as the opposite to Damon. They are. Um, a kind of again like Renly and Stannis, where fit together you have a perfect ruler, but the the skills are kind of separated. <laughs> well, uh, guilty under Kate's here says Bittersteel seems like Stannis without the redeeming qualities. Stannis's redeeming qualities is his loyalty. Bittersteel does not have that. He's just kind of an ass. So what is Daron decide to do about Damon in particular. He doesn't do anything about Shear as far as we know, other than the general, you can maintain your lifestyle, you can draw from the royal coffers, that kind of thing. He decides not to undo Aegon's proclamation that all of his bastards are now legitimate. He could. He's king. He is the ruler of the realm. Whatever he says can go. Oh, thank you, uh, Bernie. Happy Saturday, belated birthday. Yes, if you guys didn't know, uh, it was my birthday yesterday. Um... Thank, I want to thank, again, everybody for the birthday wishes. I really appreciate them. Um, only two likes away from another free shirt. Hit that like button. Slam it if you can. Um, now, why does Daron do this? Well, this is actually sort of a gift from him. Because everyone knows he can undo it. He can... Um, he's king. He's the supreme ruler of Westeros. His word is law. He can say, never mind, you guys don't have it. So ef effectively, this is a gift from Daron to the Great Bastards. He's saying, you can keep that stuff. I'm not going to undo it. Um, it sort of takes Aegon's shittiness, and it, Daron tries to turn it into something that helps him. 
And it, it does, actually. It does help. Um, oh, AK is birthday's coming up on Wednesday. Make sure you mark that one in the calendar. Oh, another one. All right. Uh, Nightbot, find us someone else. Go, 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 Nightbot. Hopefully not the same person. That would be awkward. Uh, Mike Hall. There you go. Uh, send me a message on Twitter or at AskJoeMagician at gmail.com. Um, and I will send you a code so you can pick up something from my threadless shop. A t-shirt, basically. Oh, happy birthday, Wheezy Ske uh, Squeakbox. There you go, buddy. Um, so yeah, this is a gift. Specifically because it allows the great bastards to create their own houses. They, Bittersteel, he could stop going by Agor Rivers and call himself whatever he wants. And he does. He takes up personal arms. Same for Shiera, same for Bloodraven. They could make their own house at this point, And it's likely Daron would let them. Um, so 125 for the next one. 22 away. Slam that like button. Um, and for Daron, it's kind of a no-brainer. Because none of their claims supersede his anyway. He is the firstborn. He's the male, firstborn male too, and he's he's legitimate as far as everyone's concerned. His mother was Aegon's wife. So yeah, there's there's not a lot of harm to it, really. Um the only thing is like it, it does create the idea that, well, if there's ever a succession crisis, their children or grandchildren could become a problem. But maybe that's something that Daron thinks he can manage away, which he does. Uh, create loyalty between them, keep relations good, except with bitter steel, of course. And from that, you know, he can he can turn this into a win for him. Um, and as far as Darren's concerned, if there's any sort of proof of bastardry that he's not Aegon's son and he's aiming the Dragon Knights instead, it's the the time has passed for that. Aemon the Dragon Knight is dead. Aegon the Unworthy also dead. So. Nobody's come up with any new evidence that he's not Aegon's son. That is sort of gone. So there's no there's no real harm to it. It's something that he uses to try and make the great bastards happy. Okay. So except for Bittersteel, good job here um, by Daron. He also goes further with Damon in particular. Um, but I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. So Daron's second problem he's facing, a major, major crisis is the uh, corruption in King's Landing. So Aegon ro ruled his realm. Actually, he's been paying attention to American politics lately. It's probably not that far off um, from the <clears throat> previous president. It, the realm was um, run on corrupt dealings and flattery. Um, basically, if you wanted something as a lord, you didn't have to make a legal claim. You didn't have to essentially start a rebellion or an armed conflict or do anything you really just had to become bros with Aegon bribe him in some way offer him your daughters apparently is a thing that works show up at court and be a party animal and a good guy as far as he's concerned and you would get what you want it was it created extremely corrupt um situations within Westeros in general that um Created massive power imbalances, and it made so that basically most of Aegon's counselors were shitheads. They were just dudes that bought their way into their position, um, largely by just making sure Aegon liked them. Again, this is probably some. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> We hear about this later. This happens with um, the Mad King Aerys II. The the word that George likes to use. Oh, sorry. Hang on. This is bouncing around. Okay. Is um. <laughs> uh, they were called Lickspittal Lords. Again, like I said, um, actually, Guilty Undertaker brings up the the, the prime example that the Butterwells have an a dragon egg because he gave Lord Butterwell the dragon egg in order to have sex with his daughters. That's like the level of corruption we're talking about here. 
he essentially treated the um the kingship like as badly as you can so in a sense power in the realm was based around their ability to make aegon like them and the same thing extended to their great bastards Whichever great bastard was in his favor was the one that was doing their best to suck up to him in some way. Um, and, and almost all the jobs and roles within King's Landing were divvied out this way. It was whoever did the best job buying off Aegon, got it. We're talking um, Kingsguard, we're talking small council, gold cloaks, uh, Gallowers or jailers, I guess they're called, <clears throat> who got favored in land disputes, everything, up up and down. This is how it was. It was supposed to have been some sexy daughters. I don't think um Aegon did have an eye for pretty daughters, <laughs> pretty women in particular. Um, but he seemed to the, just all comers, Aegon's in. Now, in particular, Daron hated this system. He hated that this was going on. He hated that the realm itself was essentially being sold piece by piece to the highest bidder. And Aegon was totally okay with it. And upon ascension to the Iron Throne, Daron's second priority is no more. We're done with this. No more Lickspittal Lords. No, no more pay to play. Um, we're going to reform top to bottom, try to sweep out Aegon's corruption as best as we can remove counselors, remove people from jobs, um, try to essentially undo all this stuff. Um, which is, you know, a noble goal. Politicians, or in this case, kings ending corruptions, good thing, because that's a bad way to run things. So, there's a problem with that, though. And this is something, again, as Americans, um, some of us may be distinctly aware of at this point. Those lords and lackeys that are now being kicked out of their roles and being kicked out of court and the small council and all this other stuff and all the jobs for their sons aren't going to take that lying down. They're going to be particularly upset by it. They like their positions. They were totally cool with how they bought them. Those things helped them. They made them feel powerful. <laughs> you know, they wanted to keep the things that they quote-unquote earned by selling their daughters and whatever else for um, that they got from Aegon. And that's not just going to go away because it was wrong as far as they were, as far as Daron's concerned. They didn't care about the morals. They don't care about it now. They just want their stuff back. Um... One of the examples that we get from the text is that it took Daron an entire year just to cleanse the gold cloaks of Aegon's corrupt appointments and figuring out who was loyal and disloyal and figuring out who had bought their way into the gold cloaks and which ones were abusing their power. An entire year for a king to go through and fix his own local city watch, which is not even... Like, that prestigious a job anyway. <clears throat> so, um, this happened top to bottom. Daron cleaned out King's Landing. There's one one there's one person in particular that this becomes relevant for later, and that is of course the Master of Arms Quentin Ball, aka Fireball. <laughs> um an important character in the eventual Blackfire Rebellions. But what had happened here was as Master of Arms, he had been apparently very good at um getting Aegon's favor, and as such, he was responsible for training almost all of Aegon's children in the art of the sword, basically. Um, so the fact that Bloodraven and Bittersteel and Daemon are good with swords and in battle is because of Fireball. Um, <clears throat> so Aegon, as a way of saying thank you to him, had promised uh, Fireball a spot on the Kingsguard, the next spot, 
whenever one came up. The next person to die, that's Ball's spot. And Sir Quentin Ball took this seriously. Um, he effectively divorced his wife by forcing her to join the Silent Sisters. He forced her to become a nun. Uh, because when it came up, he didn't want it to be a problem that he was already married. So, yeah, Quentin was all on board on this. He thought this was a serious promise and that it was going to happen. That Daron would honor it. That Aegon would honor it. That he was going to be the next member of the Kingsguard. Um, as we discussed, Daron thought these promises were bullshit. <laughs> He thought they were dumb, he didn't want to honor them, and he didn't. Daron largely broke most of Aegon's promises to his Lixpital lords when they came up and refused to honor quite a lot of the bargains, unless it was in particular advantageous for him to do so. Some of them worked out, like um, like with the Great Bastards, where he allowed them to stay as legitimate because it worked in his favor to curry favor with them to make sure they didn't launch a rebellion. That sort of thing. Now, a big note here. It's a, it's a good moral thing, and as for being a good ruler, that Daron did not honor these things. But it did create a huge amount of people that were very upset with them. <clears throat> All these guys who had previously thought who had been promised the world by Aegon and had relied on those promises felt that Daron screwed them. Personally. And he did. But for good reasons. So is Daron's in the right? It doesn't mean they're not unhappy with him. They're not going to be like, oh shucks, you caught us. Damn. Alright. We're not going to fine, we're not going to be upset that you uh, <laughs> you undid the things we had set up with Aegon. Because, you know, you're in the right, you have the moral high ground. That's not how they reacted. Yes, uh, Guilty Undertaker, Quentin Ball does. So did Daron solve this effectively? No, kind of. It's, it's hard to say. Like, uh, it it is one of the primary causes of a civil war that comes up about a decade later, but he sh he had to do it, right? It's a tough one. It, that's It's a tough quandary, and I am sure that most reformers that take power face that, uh, that exact problem. Is it worth it ripping out the corruption root and stem if the, if the after effects are so bad? Um, not an easy question. Okay, and the third problem that comes up, and this feeds back directly into Damon Blackfire, is that Damon's betrothal. So, one of the promises Aegon had made is that he had basically sold Damon to Tyrosh. Uh, he had sold his bastard son to marry Rohane of Tyrosh, securing an alliance um, with the Tyroshi. This was... I am sure Aegon did not do it for good reasons, but it's actually a good alliance. It's very useful for the crown for we of Westeros to make sure that they have a friend in Western Essos. At least one of the free cities, one of the Valyrian daughters, they're on good terms with. It helps them if any other ones decide to invade, if they want to take over the step zones, if there's rebel lords looking for um, looking to find alliances, it's one less city. Um, it does sort of pull them into conflicts they want to be a part of, but it's a good idea. You want to have at least one ally, and Tyrosh is a good one. <clears throat> you know, if something happened, in theory, Daron could call on army from Tyrosh and their ships, and they could be easily landed on Eastern Essos in order to back them up in any sort of conflict. So, you know, that's a good idea. That's a good alliance to keep up. Um, but there's a problem with this. Aegon made another promise on top of it. 
he promised the daemon who at this time was in puppy love with uh, Daron's younger sister Daenerys that don't worry about being married to this girl from Tyrosh this woman from Tyrosh actually um, I'm not sure if she was older but they definitely she definitely got pregnant pretty fast so um, not sure on the age difference there may have been one of the few instances where his wife was older than um, but he said don't worry about it you can have two wives because I like you so much Dame and you're so cool but there's uh, there's no way this was going to happen like zero percent chance why because Aegon himself had not even had the courage to take multiple wives as king of Westeros he feared blowback from the faith of the seven and despite having an innumerable number of mistresses he never married them he kept his first wife and uh yeah that was so he's again this is another one of Aegon's promises that was going to go nowhere he was not going to do it um but much like fireball Damon relied on it he was like all right well if the king says so I guess I'll be able to do it someday so I'm not really all that upset about being married to this woman I've never met before from Tyrosh okay I'll go along with it um here's the thing Daron had no intention of falling through the second promise. He was not going to let Damon have multiple wives, especially not to his little sister. Um, that's not a thing he was going to do. He he was very much concerned about about alliance building, and you know his first act as king, alienating Old Town and uh, the Faith of the Seven. Bad idea. Look at the history of Westeros. Targaryens deciding they don't want to fuck with the Faith of the Seven. Bad idea. So, Daron decided that the first promise would stand, though. He would go through with it, and the 13 or 14-year-old Daemon is forced to marry Rohan of Tyrosh. Um, Daemon's very upset because he's a tween at this point. He's basically Jon Snow's age. And, you know, he gets upset as teens being told to told to do things as teens get like this is a normal thing you tell a teenager to do one thing no matter what it is they're going to be upset but it's specifically because he wanted to marry Daenerys um another Daenerys Targaryen it's a good political alliance Daron's correct to go through with it but it pisses off Daemon but Daemon's a teenager and Daron's king, so he goes along with it. But he also goes along with it because Daron gives him extra promises. Uh, this is going to be a running theme. Not only is Daemon going to marry Rohan of Tyrosh, but he gets to keep the sword Blackfire. Daron's not taking it back. He gets to keep being Daemon Blackfire. He's not going to make him a bastard again. But he also gives him attractive land and permission to be a lord in his own right and to build a castle. Now it's not, not Dragonstone, it's not Summerhall as Daron would eventually build, but, you know, it's a lot more than anyone else gets. He's bribing Daemon to essentially, and yeah, of course he gives him incomes and stuff like that in his position at court. Daemon is bribed to go along with this marriage. Um, Daemon agrees. He's like, he weighs his options. He's like, okay, well... I essentially get to found a house in exchange for Mary for securing this marriage and the king's going to support me through this and gonna stick to his word. So I'm not happy about it, but I'll do it. Damon goes through with it. Um, but Damon does end up sort of resenting it. Um, but in the back of his head, he's still sort of in love with Daenerys and he still wants her and what really pisses him off and this is the one that gets brought up in A Song of Ice and Fire proper is that Daron decides he will secure another alliance specifically with uh with Dorne via marriage and this time with Princess Daenerys um oh yeah slam that like button at 125 likes uh somebody else is getting free t-shirt from my threadless shop I mean, that's a good point, Ramona. I was going to get to that later. But yeah, he does have seven kids, or at least seven kids with Rohane. So it's not like he hates her. He's not like Stannis and Solis. 
he is going through with the being married to her. It's not a sham marriage. It's a real one, at least in terms of having children. Um, so we talked about last time all the problems about Dorne and the Targaryens, in particular at this point that Dorne was not a part of the Seven Kingdoms. Aaron had married um, the Prince of Dorne's sister. And so there was a political alliance there, but not that Dorne had not agreed to become his vassal. He wanted to do this. They wanted, he wanted to stop the conflict. He wanted to stop the wars. And he realizes that the way he can do it is with Daenerys. So he marries, um, didn't Daenerys marry Maron several years before the Blackfire Valley? He couldn't have been too upset. Yeah, this is sort of a point, um, but it's, it's, it's not the primary cause, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, Daenerys is married to, I think, as Colty Hunter said, Mary Maron Martell, the Prince of Dorne. And in exchange, the Dornish agree to become a vassal of the Iron Throne without a war. Um, but like Damon, there's other concessions made, um, which pisses off some people. Basically, uh, the Prince of Dorne is allowed to remain the Prince of Dorne. It's not like the... Um, the rest of the lords, when they submitted to Aegon, they had to give up their crowns. They had to give up the royal stylings. The Dornish are allowed to keep theirs. Funny note, I was thinking about this. There are no kings and queens of Dorne except Nymeria. Everyone afterwards is a prince and a princess. So that's a big thing. Um, there is sort of a loose arrangement with taxes made. Um, basically that the Dornish get concessions for what they're doing. That um, it's a it's a political alliance. There's it's not all or nothing like it was with um, with Aegon burning down castles in the Field of Fire. The lords, who, who did lose everything as far as they're concerned, are now upset that the Dornish, who they don't like anyway, are getting things that they don't. Um, it's the same thing here with Daron's bargain with Daemon, where it does appear to piss off some of the other great bastards, that Damon is given so much more than the rest of them. Um, but in particular, Damon's upset about this because even though he had largely given up the idea that Daenerys was not going to be his anymore or would never be his, because her marriage brought up uh, lingering feelings of upset. Of, of being annoyed at this whole thing in particular that she left the court Daenerys is separated from Daemon at this point um, and she goes to live in Dorne she creates the water gardens this is also when the summer hall when summer hall is built as a um, essentially as like a peace palace sort of thing between the marcher lords and the iron throne in Dorne Daenerys leaves court so there's possibly a suggestion here that Damon and Daenerys were carrying on behind the scenes. Perhaps even though he was married to Rohane and getting busy with her because he had, this is something from the description early on. Damon at Redgrass Field later in his life is 26. He's married to Rohane of Tyrosh at 14. And his children are 12 at Redgrass Field. So uh, he had twins with her at i think uh the age oh wait no um so he's 26 his sons are 12 so he had twins at 14 they they got they got going right away they had kids right away damon was pumping out the kids for house blackfire um so you can make the case that Damien is quite a lusty character. So was he carrying on with Daenerys behind the scenes? Was that part of the reason that Daenerys got married to the Dornish and sent away? If you wanted to, wanted to make a theory about that, you might not be that off base. Um, certainly they were at court all the whole time together. Um, and he was very upset at her getting married because... The only reason you can think of, other than just hurt feelings come up again, is that it changed something in his life, which is Daenerys being separated. Something to think about. So, 
all this sort of lines up and we're going to talk about what are Damon's problems with Daron in particular. And I don't actually have to make anything up. George R. R. Martin has uh, just told us in um, So Spake Martins, you know, where people ask him questions. Um, people have asked him a lot of questions about Damon Blackfire and George has just told them the answers. So I'm going to go ahead and read some of these. Um, Oh yeah, by the way, three more likes from you guys. Somebody else is getting threadless shirt. So slam that MF and like button. I appreciate it. So what is the first one? Uh, this is about Daenerys. We were just talking about, this is a quote from George. Uh, the marriage was before the Blackfire Rebellion and the Battle of Redgrass. The decision of King Daron II to marry his sister to the prince instead of handcuffing her with Daemon Blackfire is one of the causes of the rebellion. So George is telling us that it was a cause. Damon being separated from Daenerys and her getting married to the Prince of Dorne outside of the fog of history, George saying it is true. So yes, he did care about this. Damon was upset. Oh, there we go. 125. You guys are just crushing it today. Let's do this. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Sansa would love Dorne. I bet she would. Yes, get all the lemon cakes. Who's do who's winning today? Um Nightbot. Hello? Wake up. You gonna figure it out, buddy? Uh bot, are you online? Better be online. <laughs> um Come on, buddy. Is there a way I can poke Nightbot and tell it to pick a winner from the chat? Uh, all right, well, if it pops up, we'll say something. So that's George's perspective. That's his direct answer. Um, yes, Daenerys and Damon being separated was a problem. Maybe not in particular the marriage, but her having to go to dorm, that seems to have been the thing that really pissed him off. Um, but also sort of the idea that there was a welching of Aegon's promises. <laughs> I guess it's... I thought, <laughs> what the hell, man? Um, hmm. Is there a way I can rip Nightbot? Um, Oh, there's a thing I can do here. I can just roll a name. Uh, okay. There we go. Cloaked one. There you go, buddy. You, sh you sir, get a free thing from my threadless shop. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, wait. Um, yeah, send me a message on Twitter uh, via DM, or you could send it to my email, askjoemagician at gmail.com. Um, I'll send you a code. You can go to my Thirdly shop, and you can pick up a... It's essentially just like a 15 or $17 off coupon. So you can pick up whatever you want. You don't have to buy a shirt. You can get whatever. Uh, but yeah, there you go, buddy. Thank you for uh, sticking around and chatting. You got rewarded today by Nightbot, even though you insulted him. Or it. Yeah, it. Um, so, the second reason that Damon is pushed to rebel is vanity. Uh, basically. 
So this is a quote from George. He says that Damon's friends and supporters often remarked on how much he resembled Aegon the Conqueror, or at least his likeness, since none of them had ever seen Aegon in the flesh. And indeed, there was a certain similarity, though Damon wore his hair long, flowing down to his shoulders in a silvery gold mane. He went clean-shaven, neither with neither beard nor mustache. Damon looked every inch the warrior, broad shoulders, big arms, a flat stomach, but he was a man of considerable charm. I'd give him a warm smile. He made friends easily and women were drawn to him as well. So Damon enjoyed getting compliments. And in particular, that he enjoyed people telling him that he looked like a king, that he looked like a hero of legend. Um, that it was something he enjoyed. And he, that he had a lot of friends and they all told him how awesome he was. Over time, this sort of got into his head as, you're so great. You would be a great king too, that kind of thing. Um, that that's a lesser part of it, but it's definitely there, and it's not a mistake that so many of Damon's supporters, um, at the time and even from Sir Eustace Osgrave, keyed on these things that they thought Damon was the better man. Obviously, that would get in his head too. He did think he was the better man. He thought he was great because everyone told him so, that kind of thing. Um, so keep that in mind for Damon. This is, again, something that happens with Renly and Robert a bit. You know, if everybody keeps telling you you should be king and that you're awesome and you're better than Daron and look how handsome you are and you're so great at the sword and tourneys and stuff like that, it does get in your head. Um, and the third one here is bastardy. Um, so this is another quote from George in response to somebody asking him questions. He said, Damon Blackfire rebelled so many years after Aegon the Unworthy's death for several reasons. One was his growing resentment at having the status of a bastard and what it meant. Another was that he gained counselors who urged him to it. This goes back to the vanity thing. Among them was Fireball, a knight of House Ball in the Reach who had been mastered arms at the Red Keep during Aegon's day. Aegon promised them a place in the King's Guard when an opening made itself apparent, but he died before that could happen. When a spot finally opened up under Daron, Fireball reminded him of his father's promise, but was not given a place. Uh, George said that Fireball was loosely inspired by Hotspur Percy, hence the name. Oh, wait, this is somebody uh, recalling uh, one of George's answers at a thing. But basically, the idea that Damon is a bastard, that even though he's been legitimized and even though he's been given the ability to, you know, found a house and found a castle and things, he didn't like that he, all of his power came from the throne and that he felt like a second-class citizen basically that he felt like he was one of the great lords that um you know he's legitimate he's one of the he's a prince and he didn't like that he had to take shit from daron as daron was king um yes being given blackfire would also go to your head Ex very true um so i had posted about this on twitter and uh, when i was describing what the stream was about but this is uh very much sort of a first world problem for damon the idea that he's a a bastard and that puts a stain on him this isn't like john snow who um has legitimate grievances about his role as a bastard and even in the north where it's more accepted um damon is given as far as the realm is concerned, he's not a bastard anymore. He's He has his own house, he has land, he can build a castle, he has a wife, he's a member of court, he's an important member of court. He is not being pushed around like other bastards are. But even still, he, he still feels that way, that even somebody at his level as as being as close being literally made into a real lord the sting of the way that westeros treats bastards gets to him it gets in his head um this is one of the this is one of the things that catelyn says um i believe when she's talking about john where she talks about how even though um you know daron had treated damon well and he given him everything that you know it ended up festering and becoming a cause for rebellion when rob is i think this is when rob is talking about making john legitimate or his heir that cat saying you can't undo it that even if you are kind to him and you are the best king of the north ever to your now legitimate john i don't know um whoever 
whatever name John takes on. Let's just say for for argument's sake, John uh, Blackstark. Sure, we'll call him that. If you make him John Blackstark, he's not going to forget what it was like growing up and this and how people treat him because he's a bastard. And in particular, that it inherits sort of that your life is immoral to even exist. That's sort of the idea here. Um, so Damon still has that problem, even though da Darren has gone as far as he can go, short of making him like Lord of the Stormlands or something like that. Darren, Damon still doesn't like it. Um, so the, those are his personal problems. Those are the reasons that Damon doesn't like Daron. But I'm going to point out again here that he didn't really do anything about this. At Daron is crowned at 14 years old, and um, he doesn't rebel until he's 25 years old. He lived with this stuff. He it upset him, but it did not make him go to war. He didn't want to, apparently. Um, maybe it was a slow simmering thing, but all these problems that existed when he rebelled also existed when Daron came to power. He, people have been telling him this stuff for years, and Daron did his best to mitigate these, these problems, but, you know... Um, there were other reasons for his war. And this is, uh, again, why I talked about on Twitter where I was talking about this this uh, stream where it was like, is it really Damon's war? Was Damon's causes for action the same as the people that uh, followed him? And I would say, um, no. I don't think Damon's causes of action are the reason there were there was a rebellion. I think it's the reason he agreed to uh, be a part of the rebellion along with, you know, we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> the arrest in a little bit, but you can see that none of these re reasons are cause for other people to push you to be king. And in particular, they're not really reasons that show that Daron should be deposed for Damon. Like, it's not... Daron did all he could to erase the bastardy of Damon Blackfire. He made him a real lord. Um, he played into his vanity. He let him keep Blackfire, let him keep his name. He gave him funds, let him stay at court. He didn't, he didn't bully him. He didn't exile him. Damon was still a part of his life. And, you know, the Daenerys thing may have been, an, I, I guess, a mistake, but that's not really something that should have caused a realm-wide rebellion, that kind of thing. So, what actually made Damon's rebellion happen? And, actually, this is something I, I, want, I meant to point out earlier, but Ramona talked about it in the chat. It's that, as far as Damon was concerned, he got on with his life. He had something like seven or eight, I think like... I forget the exact count on his kids, but he had a lot of kids. He died at 26, got married at 14, and had like seven plus kids in that time. Um, there's no Blackfire bastards as far as we know about, so even if he didn't particularly care for Rohan of Tyrosh and really wanted Daenerys, it wasn't like he was screwing around on her. Perhaps Daenerys, maybe before she was married, but otherwise nobody's ever showed up pretending to be a bastard of Damon Blackfire. The only Blackfires we know about that show up are the real ones, because he had so many sons and daughters. Um, and even the explicit Daenerys his marriage call out, again, he didn't rebel for eight years after that happened. If it was such a problem that he had to go to war, why wait eight years? You think it would be something that would happen right away. So this creates the picture that Damon was relatively okay with his life. He wasn't, it wasn't everything he wanted. He didn't get everything he wanted, but, you know, it was going good. It was going okay for him. Um, he had problems with Daron, but not rebellious ones. So, yeah, what, what were the actual things that were going on that led to his rebellion? And I think one of the big ones um, that we talked about during the Bloodraven stream is that the rivalry between Agor, Rivers and Bloodraven and Daron himself 
sort of spilled over into Damon. Oh, uh, here. Don't worry, Damon says the argument about of Cat's heirs about trusting John is fine, but what about his heirs? Applies to a lot of targets and their dragons would trust being on the fifth with a dragon. Yes, Ares' son. And so that is, that is a good point. Um, that's a reason to not legitimize da uh, Damon and let his sons be legitimate as well. But that's sort of a problem for another day. Damon, Daron was trying to stop the war now. <laughs> stop the uh, rebellion going on around him. Um, so a big part of Blood Raven's story is that he had a famous rivalry with Aegor Rivers, the other of the great bastards, in particular over their role in court, which waxed and waned with Aegon's, um, essentially his mood at the time, and which of their mothers he liked best at the moment, but also Shira Seastar. Um, she and Blood Raven were lovers for quite a long time. I think her and Bittersteel at some point were, but at the very least, Bittersteel was jealous that Blood Raven had such a close relationship with Shira, even though they never actually married. Um, and when we look at Daron's court, Blood Raven integrated into the new, um, into the Daron's new um, power structures. But as far as we know, Bittersteel is not. Um, Blood. Quentin Ball is allowed, like, uh, Bittersteel and Quentin Ball are to keep their positions as it was, but they're not rewarded like Damon was, um, Bittersteel in particular, and as Bloodraven is. Bloodraven is also given the ability to do things that Bittersteel is not. Um, so you can sort of see how uh, Bittersteel's problems with Daron and Bloodraven in particular kind of spilled over, because if you look at his problems, they are... These are things that he has in common with Damon Blackfire. So he feels shut out of his uh, court with Aegon dead, which is sort of how Damon feels, that they're no longer um, as important as they were. For instance, it now goes to Daron's son, Baylor Breakspear, to be the next heir instead of the way Damon was treated for a lot of his life. Bittersteel at one point was like that too. Uh, Bittersteel does not get his preferred wife in Shira Seastar, um, as Damon does not with Daenerys Targaryen. He asked her 49 times. Yeah. He kept asking. She never said yes. Um, and Bittersteel is unhappy with being a bastard and that he, he actually has more cause than Damon does because Damon gets so much from Daron in order to make him happy. As we talked about all the, uh, the gifts and the true legitimization Bitter still gets none of those things. So he's actually truly unhappy with being a bastard. So using these things, Damon and Agor Rivers bond over their shared problems with Daron. So every time they talk, Bittersteel brings these up and Damon goes, yeah, me too. And after like 12 years, these things just kind of build up and he creates a framing for Damon. Um, there's a quote earlier that uh, Bittersteel had essentially whispered in Damon's ear, ear for 10 years, and that's true. He was one of the prime reasons by putting his problems onto Damon and making his perception of his, I guess, I guess first world problems within Westeros more real than they should be. Um, I don't know if he was a simp for Shear, because they, they definitely were, they had a relationship. They just never got married. Um, so that that's a that's a real problem there, um, and it's through Agor to Damon as well. Another character we're about to talk about that other people's problems are are used to inflame Damon in the sense that he's being basically manipulated to be unhappy with his position. Okay, let me say this a different way. <laughs> Damon is unhappy, but he doesn't want to go to war for it. Other people do want war, and so they make Damon feel angrier about the things in his life by never stopping talking about them. Just every conversation is about how Daron sucks and how you're treated as a bastard and everything's bad for you, even though it's not. Like, objectively, it's not bad for Damon. Um, so the other person that's doing this is Quentin Ball, Fireball. As we talked about earlier, he wanted to be on the Kingsguard, 
when a member of the King's Guard died, went and ball, went to Daron and said, Your father promised me a spot on the King's Guard. And Daron said, Tough. Uh, I am naming Sir Willem Wilde to be the next member of the King's Guard. And Quentin Ball takes this personally. And afterwards, after this happens, he joins the uh, Bitter Steel convincing Damon to do something about him being the most popular of the great bastards sort of thing. Um, one and the same. That, that him and uh, Bitter Steel are doing the same thing. They are making Damon mad a lot. It's interesting how Glendon and Damon II are juxtaposed against their father's legacies. Yeah, um, that's true. We see Glendon Ball in the Mystery Knight. We see Damon II in the Mystery Knight. And, um, yeah, they, they live in their father's shadows. Quentin Ball, along with Bitter Shield, get most of the blame for convincing Damon to go to war. But it wasn't just those two. Um, they were... They found allies at court and they found power by looking to other lords who were upset about other things. And this is sort of, it's, it's almost like a, um, I'm not sure what the right term is. It's kind of like money laundering in a sense that there are people that want Daron removed from power. And the reasons they want it have almost nothing to do with the problems Damon have, but they use Quentin Ball and Bitter Steel to convince Damon to do it for their own purposes. Um, and those are, of course, the guys we talked about earlier, the former Lickspittle Lords, the guys that were displaced by Daron's reforms, the ones that were upset that their corruption that they had used to gain power and wealth and influence in Westeros were gone, and that Daron told them to kick rocks. They were still pissed about this. Um... They still they wanted those things back, and they were looking for someone to be on the Iron Throne that would be more like Aegon used to be, if not in the direct sense of being openly corrupt, but at least somebody that did not have the political will and the moral spine that Daron had. Somebody that they could manipulate and influence their way into power again, and for a lot of them, they saw Damon as the person we could do. They could do this with. Um, we talked about at the beginning that Damon is somebody that can be influenced. He's somebody that can be manipulated, and they saw that and they they pushed it for it. They formed sort of a secret alliance behind the scenes of lords who are upset with Daron, and became a little faction. And they essentially, again, used. Quentin Ball and Agar Rivers to convince Damon to do what they want. You know, they were looking for the promises of their positions from Aegon the Fourth to be restored, at least in part, which by the way is a common Blackfire theme. The rest of the Blackfire rebellions, everyone that supports them are somebody that feels wrong that something being taken away from them, and they want it back. That's basically what's going on here. Um Manchester Shoals. What was the intent behind Aegon the Fourth legitimizing his bastards? Did he just want chaos and rebellions, or do you genuinely think that Daron was not actually his son? That's been hotly debated for quite a long time. Um, Aegon was just kind of a dick, so it's entirely possible that he did it to throw a chaos grenade as he died. Um, but it's also quite possible that there's a parallel to be drawn between him himself and Robert Baratheon. That on his deathbed. Robert tells Ned to name Joffrey his heir, and Ned changes the wording to be said Joffrey his true heir, meaning that it's for Stannis. So you can't discount the possibility that part of it had to do with um, with whoever was hearing Aegon's will, who may have wanted Daemon to be king next, that kind of thing. But um, he's just such a bad person, and he's seem to enjoy screwing with people and just being a bad person that it's entirely possible he did it for malicious reasons um or he said something similar and then somebody who for reasons all their own changed the wording um certainly possible so yeah the lickspittle lords are one 
of the major factions that's behind Damon. He doesn't really think of it that way, but that's what ends up happening. I wonder if he ever had a moment of reflection. It's like, boy, all the guys that are supporting me are the same ones that were pissed off about uh, being kicked out of court by uh, by Daron. I wonder what that makes me. Am I just a pawn in a war I don't understand? No, probably not. Um, if Dar if Damon had that level of um, intellectual wondering, we don't really know. But he certainly took their support. So maybe it was at that point that he just sort of needed help. But certainly possible that he didn't think about it that hard. That he just saw people who liked him and were good to him and were friendly. Much in the way that Aegon chose his supporters and just sort of went with it. can see perhaps why they thought that Damon was somebody they could use to get back to power. So, and the other very major faction that found support with Damon and also found an unlikely alliance with these former Lixpital lords, and that is the anti-Dornish faction. So this is a very important part that, uh, this is the reason I talked about it so much in the last stream, the problems between the Iron Throne and Dorne, it's that there were quite a lot of lords, especially those in the Reach and the um, and the Stormlands, that did not want peace with Dorne. They liked being at permanent war. It meant that they could go become heroes. It meant they could go try and loot and sack uh, Dornish holdings. It's a way for them to create names for themselves. And there's also the sense that uh, it's kind of their legacy. We see that with Aris Oakhart's chapter in A Feast for Crows where he feels so out of place being in Dorne because he's like a couple gener like not that long ago, I would have been fighting these people to death. That would have been my whole life. Even as an Oak who is relatively far from Dorne. Um, they saw it as a way to gain influence. They saw it as a way to gain wealth. And it was just sort of their thing. Their thing was fighting the Dornish and they were particularly upset that Garon ended the war, this centuries-long conflict, with a marriage alliance. That's not how they wanted to end that war. They wanted to end it with crushing the Dornish underneath their heels. They wanted to go into Sunspear and loot the treasures of the Martells. They wanted to go to Starfall and steal Dawn. Like, that's what they wanted. And Garon denied them that ability by making a peace it's kind of the weirdest way ever, but this is essentially, this is a thing in the real world, like people that are war hawks or um, people that are for war because it allows them to become rich and powerful. <laughs> Boy, that, that's not a thing that's, oh yeah, yeah, it is a thing. The military industrial complex, it's a real thing. There are people that genuinely love war and always having a convenient opponent. And it's the same thing here with Dorne and the Stormlanders, the Marcher Lords, and the Reach. Um, they also had historical problems with them. Um, it's the same reason that the, uh, the North and the Western Landers categorically hate the Ironborn. They've been fighting for forever, and it's a lingering feud that will never go away. Um, yeah, that's also a good point, Guilty Undertaker. How did this nerd conquer the Dornish when we couldn't? He did it the way um, you know, good rulers do it. They do it without killing everybody. Um, but that's not what they wanted. And in, in a way, that's sort of the point of the Stepstones. Um, that quite a lot of the lords during Daemon Targaryen's time, the other Daemon, um, liked him, is that that they used the Stepstones as an outlet. They liked killing pirates. They liked going on adventures and being able to flex their muscles and show that they are cool. And they want to do that by killing a lot of people. So that's what the wars on the Stepstones and the, uh, the pirates of Essos was about. And it's the same thing here for the Dornish. That's how they saw them. Um, so that faction is very upset with Daron. They think that if they kill Daron or remove him from the throne, that that will break the alliance or that Damon would break the alliance perhaps to get Daenerys back. Um, 
that they want the Forever War to come back with Dorne, and they see Damon as the vehicle to do this. So those are a lot of the actual reasons. It's one of those things that you have to separate when you're thinking about it. The reason for the man personally and the reason his allies supported him. The reason his allies supported him have very little reason to why he decided to do it. Um, it was a lot of people using Damon to get what they wanted, and almost none of them cared about his causes of action. Um, you know, do they were they going? Did they want to put Damon on the throne to improve the lives of bastards? Absolutely not. They want to do it to let him marry Daenerys only in the sense that it would let them create more war with Dorne. Did they care about um, any sort of quality differences between uh, Daron's rule and Daemon's? No, it wasn't that Daron was a bad king. It's that he was a good king and that pissed off a lot of people who liked bad kings. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to get your head around, but yeah, there are people who find it advantageous to have rulers who are openly corrupt and bad at their jobs because it lets them do things they wouldn't be able to do previously. And they were hoping for that from Damon. Um, so if you're thinking about it in a larger sense, is the Blackfire Rebellion about any of the things that Damon cared about? No, probably not. There's all there's people all across Westeros, there's lords all across Westeros choose a time frame that have problems with the Iron Throne. And they don't go to war and they don't found a rebellion because nobody cares. Nobody really cares. It's the same. It's largely the same reason. Um, you know, this is the same thing that come, pops up with Robert's Rebellion where uh, people got very upset with the, the TV show where they said Robert's Rebellion was built on a lie. And yes and no, it's the same thing here for Damon. Robert's cause of action was about Liana and it was about um, specifically her being denied from him and also the fact that Ares called for his head. That's not the same reason the Lord supported Robert. They supported him for other reasons. Uh, they had their own personal grievances with Ares that they used Robert in order to support who effectively get Robert to fix when he got on the throne. Um, you know, <laughs> that, that's, that's the truth of it. It is both are true. And it's the same thing here for Damon. Daenerys is his Lyanna and he's, he allows himself to be the figurehead for his own purposes that have very little to do with the people supporting him. And I think the other thing to, uh, to mention here before, we're not going to talk about the actual rebellion itself, but we're going to talk about the inciting event. And that is, of course, Damon's arrest. Um, so this is a very strange one. The Lixpital Lords, the Anti-Dornish, Bittersteel, and Fireball have been trying for more than a decade to get Damon to go to war, and he wasn't going to do it. He had refused. He was pretty happy with his life. Um, and see a reason to risk it as far as we know. But what ends up happening is that Blood Raven and Archmaester Marion tell King Daron that Daemon is on the verge of war, that within a month he's going to declare himself openly as King Daemon, and he's going to challenge Daron for the, um, for the Iron Throne, and that they have to stop this before it happens. They have to arrest Damon and put him in chains before he can really get going. This sounds strange. It should. <laughs> what particular thing had changed to make Damon want to do this? It's unclear from what we know. Um, it's, it's possibly true that at, at this point, Damon had had enough that it, all the, the uh, concerted effort to get him to go to war had finally worked, and he was like, yeah, I'll think about it. But it doesn't seem like it's ready to go at this point. Um, 
Do we ever get told Daenerys actually wanted Damon? Yes, you don't understand. Uh, it is apparently a mutual thing that Damon and Daenerys did want each other. Um, that if they had their their choice, they they would have been married instead of to Prince Marin and to uh, Rohan of Tyrosh. So yes, they were separated. But, you know, as we talked about, that was eight years ago. Um, Damon's prime with bastardry had largely been erased by Daron. Um, people were still telling him he would make a better king, but there wasn't a particular reason to point to within Daron's rule at this point to say that that was true. That as, if you're looking at it from a purely selfish perspective, Damon could make the logical argument that, like, I, maybe, but he's done pretty well by me and the rest of us. Like, the realm's in a good place. Dorne's finally a part. We don't have to go to war with Dorne every two years, so things are going okay. And this is what makes the arrest very strange. You sort of have to take Bloodraven at his word. And there's good reason to think that maybe Bloodraven is telling the truth. Why? Because he's literally magical. Um, he has informants everywhere. He's a skin changer. He has the ability to... Um, see things and hear things that no one else can like in particular i've had a long-running theory that blood raven's um skin changing ability allowed him to read letters because he could probably skin change the raven while the letters being read um and that would allow him to um to know what was in the letters without physically being there and it would confuse his opponents we know that a, that is a thing that the idea of a thousand eyes in one that Bloodraven has eyes in every room, it's because he's literally magical. So it's entirely possible that despite all of this, it is true that Damon had finally assented to the idea of a rebellion. That Bittersteel and Quentin, uh, Quentin Ball had gotten to him and he said, start making plans and we'll try it. But like, come back to me with what you got. Like, who are our allies? Where would you attack? Like, start planning it and like, let's see how uh, real this is. So that, that that really gets to the crux of it. And I think Pat Doherty said this uh, during his email last time is he suggested that Blood Raven shot first, essentially that um that maybe he made it up or maybe he exaggerated how real it was for personal reasons because again this is not just about damon blackfire it's also about agor rivers it's about these lickspittle lords it's about these anti-dornish all these people that blood raven sees as a threat to daron's rule and also his place at court and the um you know the future of house targaryen which he is very invested in so is it true was Damon about to go to war? Did Bloodraven make it up? I think if you look at Bloodraven's history, and especially from what we see in particular the Mystery Knight with Damon's son, Damon Blackfire, uh, the second, he did not make up that rebellion. He did not push Damon to do something he didn't want to do. He didn't make lord butterwell do it he didn't make any of the other lords show up and plan their rebellion he knew about it and let it happen so that he could then essentially round them all up and arrest them he did not frame anybody in that situation but he also let them hang themselves you know that's that's kind of what ended up happening there so if blood raven is saying that he knows that Damon's about to go to war in a month and that Bittersteel and Fireball finally worked, then probably telling the truth, I would say. Um, there's not a real history of him making up threats to justify things. He normally just knows about them because he's literally magical. But if that, I think this is something that Pat Doherty also brought up that's a little strange. The arrest of Damon, the failed arrest that Fireball. Um, averted is very strange in that sense because he's so he's such a good operator and he's so good at using his manipulations and his different informants that you would think that he could effectively capture and put Damien in chains if he wanted it to. And this sort of gets them to the idea that 
that Blood Raven instigated the war in order, or he instigated Damon's arrest in order to create the cause of action to to basically allow Damon to show himself as false. Um, yeah, you guys are saying in the chat, he gave him the rope and they used it, right? That's more his style, rather than actively making up stories that are untrue. Um, but remember at this point in time that Blood Raven's very young. Blood Raven, I think, is 21 years old at the time, or 20 years old at the time of the Blackfire Rebellions. By the time we see him in the Mystery Night, he's far older, and he's had a lot more experience with war and manipulation. So it's entirely possible that this was a blunder by him that um that he messed up how this went because i i previously said look at the mystery night and how he operates that's how he operates after the blackfire rebellion and it seems to have worked out a lot better uh the second time around that he allowed a different daemon to declare themselves first and then showed up with the royal army and then had all the guys rounded up and took care of them like that. I think that's what he was trying to do with Damon initially. And I think because of his inexperience and his youth at the point and maybe his lack of, con of uh, political control at that point, it just didn't work out. There were too many things he didn't, um, didn't account for. He was maybe a little bit too rash, all these kind of things. And, that it's his mistake. And I think that would work as a storytelling perspective that, that Blood Raven's biggest fault is that he created the rebellions that he ended up trying to solve. And that would work with George's general writing that doesn't, he doesn't like it. He doesn't like just creating scenarios for characters. That is just things happen. He wants there to be choice and he wants it there to be a personal failing, he wants there to be a tragedy to it. And Blood Raven gets far more tragic figure, and it kind of explains his his obsession with the Blackfires later and Damon's sons and his behavior and how extreme he gets. If that he knows that the reason for the war is that he failed at this particular junction, you can imagine future Blood Raven going back in time and watching it and trying to influence it and trying to make sure it doesn't happen and just being frustrated by that and him just getting perspective on it. Like, yeah, it, everything was my fault. I fucked this up. Me personally. I think that works as a much better story. And I think it works better for Damon as a character. Um, that he does not seem to be a master manipulator, a schemer, a political mastermind that was ready to go at the moment's notice. It makes a lot more sense that it that Blood Raven accidentally pushed him to it and then failed at stopping him, basically. That it's the the fail state of the mystery. Um and that may be why George wrote it that way, because the the actions of the mystery knight are almost identical to this arrest and Damon started his real war. It's just that Damon uh via Fireball and his friends at court was able to succeed where his son could not or at least succeed for a while um so i think i think i hope i made the case here that i don't think damon blackfire's rebellion is entirely his fault i think he was a figurehead being used by other people and that he was a kind of in over his head and push the things that left alone he probably would not have done um you know there's no stories of him being a massive bully there's no stories of him abusing people no stories of him being a bad person and by all accounts it seems like he was pretty happy with his life so that's kind of i don't know what do you guys think especially people in the in the comments afterwards you I don't know. Do you agree with my take? Do you think that's a good assessment of him? Maybe I'm being too fair to Damon Blackfire. Maybe he actually is more like a character like Harry the Air from uh, from the Vale, uh, somebody who is superficially a good dude, but is um, maybe maybe the fact that he did stage a rebellion underlies an inherent selfishness and uh, 
maybe a messiah complex in Damon, which is something we see very often with uh the Targaryens. It's cool. That is such a thing. And one thing um that we that has not popped up here, but is very popular among Targaryens is the idea of is there some kind of magical thing? Is there a prophecy going on? Did Damon like I don't know, did Damon read a similar prophecy as Rhaegar did and that convinced him of a sort of destiny? Like that is on the table, but not something we're told about. But also we're not really told of Damon reading a lot of things. So um Yeah, uh, if you guys slam the like button seven more times before we uh, end the stream in a little bit, somebody else is getting a free shirt from the Joe Magician Threadless Shop. So yeah, 117 of you. If you haven't slammed that like button, go ahead and do so. You have, And people in the chat will have a chance to go ahead and get yourself some ass waffle gear or some Joe Magician stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think Anime Love and Recall makes the exact point that... Uh, and it kind of restates it in a way that's good. Did Damon have dreams like his son? Certainly his son dreamed of dragons and saw the future. Is that a part of Damon's story? That's not something we know about, but it possibly could be a part of his motivation. Um, maybe a... That'd be more of a theory crafting thing, but we know so little about him personally that it'd be hard to say that. Um, certainly Blood Raven. Could be on that side though um yeah and stefan makes the po good point that uh darren tried to rest them over what we know for now as rumors instead of talking it out yeah it's i think it's also a mistake by darren to go through with the um the arrest although maybe i don't yeah it, it very much could have been a mistake oh thanks for the uh super sticker from michael james thumbs up thanks buddy um oh we hit 150 i see oh there we go all right let's do this um uh, all right nightbot let's see if we can get you to do this command again um oh okay all right, all right, all right. Uh, so I, I get how this works now. Um, all right, so what we're going to do for this last one is uh, if you want to win a free, a free T-shirt from my Threadless shop, type in the word shirt. Type the word shirt. Put it into the chat. Um, do I look blurry? I hope not. Um, you hate Nightbot. Yeah. Type the word shirt in chat. Everyone that enters will have a chance to win. There we go. I think the way it was doing it before, it was taking active chatters. So people that had said something in the chat. So I think that's why it wasn't working. Um, so yeah. Okay, there we go. A lot more people are eligible to win. Okay, good. Uh, we'll give it... I'll give it another couple minutes. Um, I'm going to answer a question here and um, that I got from uh, Twitter. This is the one from Grey Waste Tim. Um, he said, for the most part, it seems the Blackfire support tends to come from the Marcher Lords who had problems with the Dornish. How much of the rebellion do you think came about due to prodding from these Lords? How would it affect the probable new Blackfire rebellion with uh, Young Griff? Even port from the Martells, and also by the time it's airs, I'll record my first episode of City and Nights podcast of Gray Area, and just want to promote her. Yes, uh, Gray Area on the Obsidian Nights podcast has a lot of uh, guests on it, and I guess Gray Waste is one of them. So go check them out. Uh, I'm sure they will have a good discussion. <laughs> um. 
I just want to make sure it's actually counting everybody. Uh, okay, so it says 20 people are entered right now. So I guess you if 1 in 20 chance of winning. Um, it's Although it has excluded people that personally, that already got picked for, some, uh, for the other one. Um, Okay, good. It's it's keeping up correctly. So I agree with Grey Waste Tim's analysis here that I think that is a definite part of it. That um I think as as I made the point that there is a separation distinctly between Damon's motivations and his allies. And for sure the Marcher Lords are a big part of the faction that split Westeros. And those would probably be the uh the southern faction. The reason that people from the Western lands and whatnot, and when you know the Riverlands, the Vale, the Crownlands would probably not have quite the same motivation and those would largely be the spittle lords and that's kind of the uh the breakdown of their things but i think it is definitely ex insightful to also look at um i i know brendan beefish has done this in the past when he's looking at uh young griff's potential rebellion within westeros who his allies will be and it's the sort of the same kind of people it's those that are um Who's upset at the moment? Who has lost land? Who has lost in previous wards? Those will largely be their um, young griffs, potential lords. And that's one of the reasons that people think that um, somebody like Lord Randall Tarley will switch sides. Um, because he has a problem with the Martell. I mean, the not the Martells, the, um, the Tyrells. Same for, I think, Mathis Rowan. People that have lost something recently are the most likely to switch sides. All right, so we got uh, 22 people eligible. Uh, last call. Anybody that hasn't put it in yet, type the word SHIRT, S-H-I-R-T, and you will be at, entered to win a free T-shirt from my, uh, my third list shop. Just a shirt post. Nightbot does suck. I wish it was better. Um... Uh, Liet Rubenfeld says, what if Blood Raven and Baylor the Blessed read the same prophecy about a false dragon that would show up at the same time? Prince, that was promised, like Christ the Antichrist. I think that's definitely on the table. I think you cannot ignore the fact that Blood Raven may have been influenced, even at a young age, by dragon dreams, visions of the future, reading prophecy. Definitely him and Shear are all into that stuff. Um, all right, I think we got everybody. Let's roll. Um, all right, uh, Davy Mack, way to go, Davy. Uh, you, sir, or can't actually tell. But you have uh, won yourself a free t-shirt from my Threadless shop. So after the, you can do it now or after the stream ends, send me a message on Twitter via DM, or you can email me at askjoemagician at gmail.com. And uh, I will send you a code that you can use at my Threadless shop. Way to go, buddy. uh so yeah that's a it's a christmas thing i have a bunch of them i want to give them away and that's how we're doing it today thank you guys all for slamming that mf and like button um and this sort of gets to a point for some of the comments that i got on the previous video for instance rumor zanfir she uh she brought up the point that if um that basically if damon was innocent of his of plotting rebellion why did he then raise in rebellion after um the king's guard came to arrest him um so it may be telling a bit that blood raven was not entirely off base that damon's reaction was to rise in rebellion and suddenly all of his allies are exactly the ones that you would think But yeah, I think there's definitely truth to it. 
that maybe there had been a sort of um, an escalation recently that led to led Blood Raven to believe that rebellion was imminent, whether it was or not. But I definitely do like the idea that he caused it by um, maybe seeing conversations he wasn't supposed to and overreacting to them. Because that's one of the things I talked about during another stream, particularly the Glass Candle stream and the Marwin stream, that a lot of people give characters who have magical abilities and extended knowledge of things a lot of credit for seeing those things correctly. And that's there's no reason for that to be true. Um, having more information depends entirely on your ability to interpret and react to it correctly or in a positive way. I, I made the comparison to the internet. Like we are in the age of the most information possible that any human has ever had at your fingertips. Like even right now, us talking, not possible for most of human history. And yet the same problems of people seeing what they want to and cherry picking things and convincing themselves of obvious falsehoods still happens. So it's entirely possible that Blood Raven could have seen Damon possibly being more open to rebellion than he used to be in the past. And also he caused it by reacting to it in a poor way. Yes, inadvertently started instead. It's a it's a definitely a part of George's wheelhouse. The characters who have access to time travel often make their problems happen, or um trying to avoid something is what makes it happen. Um so it's entirely possible that Ramona is correct that Damon was plotting it, but also maybe not as seriously as, uh, perhaps as seriously as Blood Raven and Believe. And I think that's really the legacy of Damon Blackfire. It's, um, it, I don't think it is entirely his fault that his rebellion happened. And I think. You cannot hang everything that happened on him because so many people were pushing for him to do it that really didn't care about Damon in particular. It wasn't about opposing. This is a big break in particular about uh, if you're comparing this to Robert's rebellion against Ares II, the Mad King. It's basically that there were really good reasons to want Ares off the Iron Throne and not shitty, power-grabbing, corrupt ones. Ares had broken the feudal contract in, with uh, the murdering of the Lordlings and the Lord Stark and his call for the heads of people for being for not doing anything worthy of treason and that his brutal rulership had led to his downfall. None of those things are at play for Daron, and in a way, that kind of reflects into the current story. Um, it does make the case... <laughs> Well, it's interesting to think about that in both situations, the, rebe the rebellions happen, but for very different reasons. And it's not that, um, I, I, would, I would say Robert's rebellion is justified and Damon's probably, um, even though you can find a lot of similarities between them. Uh, Hun Master says, Bittershield would have eventually declared for Damon. Uh, I bet he would have eventually done so to force a rebellion, force for Damon to declare himself king. Yeah, I, I definitely think that Bittershield is one of the primary architects of Damon's war more than Damon. That um, it's his interactions, it's his push, it's his pushing, his urging, and inflaming people's bitterness, basically, as his name suggests, and to create the war itself. That probably would not have happened. Like, let's say you go back in time and Aegon the Fourth dies and someone puts an arrow in Bittersteel's heart and he dies right there. Does Damon eventually start the Blackfire Rebellions? I would say there's a good chance he, he, that it never happens. That, um, or Bittersteel or Fireball. Choose one of them, kill one of them. I'm guessing the Blackfire ne Rebellions never happen. Damon's feelings don't change, but the way that they um, those two manage to create a faction 
around him is severely diminished. And it's incredibly telling that even after Damon's death, Bittersteel effectively hijacked the Blackfire Rebellions and made it about himself as the Lord Commander of the Golden Company in the way he played Kingmaker, that he essentially made it the, the future Blackfire Rebellions dependent on him for success. He effectively it became the Bittersteel Rebellions that happened to have a Blackfire in order to be the, uh, the thing that people coalesced around. Hey, Sarah, how's it going? Um, just like in Greek prophecy, knowing the future almost always leads to causing the exact future. That's also a part of Macbeth, I believe. That's a big part of that play. Um, is Shakespeare. Um, there's also a comment from the uh, previous live stream. We're just about done here, but um, going to get out of here pretty soon. Um, Uh, this is Benjamin uh, Von Stein, and they had a problem. Well, they had uh, a problem or a critique of what I was saying about, in particular, Daron the Young Dragon, and how it was a vanity play for him uh, that he tried to conquer Dorne in order to make himself be the new conqueror and create a legend around himself. And they make a, some good points about the idea that with the dragons now dead, they, the Targaryens need to find a new way, <clears throat> a new way to secure their rule. That they couldn't do it with fire and blood anymore. They needed to be actual rulers to flex their strength as a house. And as the young dragon was concerned, beating Dorne when all of his predecessors had failed, even with their dragons, would have made that case. And I think that is true. I think that's a good point. That um. It, it wasn't just about vanity, it was about securing power. But I will say that Daron wrote multiple books about himself and his conquest, which definitely make the case that a lot of it was about his vanity and his personal pride. That, um... That there is definitely a big part of the young dragon that saw himself as, um that wanted to be seen as the greatest king Westeros has, had ever seen, in particular because he liked that, and not because he wanted to um, just make a savvy political play, that it was a lot about um, his ego. Bittersteel is the most bitter over his bastardry. He never received the same degree of favor as the other bastards. He didn't want Damon to rise as king so he could be hand. Yeah, he wanted to, um, he definitely wanted to be the kingmaker. Bittersteel the kingmaker, basically. He wanted, although we can see from his treatment of Damon's children, that even if he eventually pushed Damon into power, it's quite clear that he eventually would have minimized Damon as a character, as a person, even as king, and found a way to make it himself that he wanted to be the real ruler and Damon was just the pawn he wanted to push uh shades of Julius Caesar with Daron the first yeah and doesn't then Alexander the great write a bunch of books about himself Napoleon was famous for um I believe I'm pretty sure Napoleon wrote about himself quite a lot I'm pretty sure Alexander did too well, definitely Alexander had a huge ego with the naming of all the cities Alexandria across the world, everywhere he went. Um, so that I think I think that's a that's a really big part of it. Definitely, there's practical reasons and there's historical contexts for why Daron felt he had to do this, but. It is telling that he chose this one and that the way he wrote about it and wrote about his conquest. Um, his conquest that lasted like a couple, lasted less than a fell apart pretty quickly. But he wrote about it like it was the best of victories in the world. And it turns out he could conquer but not rule. But that is a good distinction. Um, I would say also in response to uh, Benjamin's comment that I was definitely trying to summarize 
it was not a, a young dragon stream. So if it was more about him in particular, I definitely would have gone into more detail. But I think Vanity, if you had to take his motivations from what we hear in his actions, that Daron, the young dragon's reasons for invading Dorne were like 70% Vanity and 30% trying to preserve his house. That it had a lot more to do with him personally than... Um, than trying to be a quality ruler of his dynasty, basically. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't rename uh, Sunspear after himself, basically, is what I'm saying. Uh, the Woods Witch of the Weeping Weirwood. That is a tongue twister. I'm recovering from my vaccine booster shot. Good for you. Glad you got your booster shot. Good job. Um, I had a tough time with my booster too. Um, I actually felt very, I got very sick. Uh, I basically felt like I had the flu and I almost bought a $600 gaming chair until like some little bulb in the back of my head said, Hey man, maybe it isn't a good idea to buy a $600 chair right now. Um, I'm glad I could entertain you with Damon Blackfire talk. So uh, that's about it. Uh, I mean, we got started a little late because I had problems getting my audio set up. You guys have any other comments or questions you want to throw out? Um, put them into the chat at me, bros. Um, anything I missed while I was talking, go right ahead. Um, also, obviously, thanks everybody for uh, slamming the MF and like button. And if you're one of the people that uh, won a one of the giveaways today, Make sure that you message me either on Twitter or you can email me and I'll send you the code so you can go to my Threadless shop and pick something up. Um, yeah, I would have gotten one of the um, Secret Lab ones and it was just like, what a stupid idea. Not worth the money. Would have been a waste. I ended up solving my problem by putting a cushion on my instead of spending 600 um in the future we definitely will look more at the blackfire rebellion as a war and a conflict itself but i really want to do a specific character focus here on damon himself damon the person and the, the separation of his cause versus the cause of his allies uh because i think that is important to understanding his character and understanding where he fits into song of ice and fire in particular on comparisons between Robert and Renly, um, that it's not just a story for story's sake, that it does it's a resonance story that adds me to the other ones. Oh, uh, super chat here from Aaron. Um, second, the old Mr. Say Hammers. Um, don't like their app they make it hard to read everything i have to go into the uh the web thing deck web portal to read messages audio's cutting in and out uh probably because i wasn't facing the microphone uh 25 dollars from aaron m uh, happy holidays, Matt, and thank you for all your great content this year. You've been such a bright spot for all of us during the pandemic. I'm glad you feel that way. I'm glad we have fun here. And, um, you know, the streams are fun, and I enjoy doing them. And I hope you get out of it at least as much as I do from it. You know, it's a two-way street. It's not just me talking the whole time. I enjoy the back and forth. Um, I think what's happening is that my filters are on a little bit too strong. So when the signal gets too low, um, the noise gate or the, um, I forget which one it is. One of the filters comes in and cuts off uh, sound below a certain point. So if I start talking, then it goes away. Yeah, you see, that's basically what it is. So I have to keep talking into the mic to make sure it works. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Um, Orange Dame says, if the Targs believe they had to unite Westeros to save the world against the others, repeated attempts to bring Dorne into the realm make sense uh, beyond reasons related to increasing and improving their power. That is one of the primary uh, questions about Aegon the Conqueror and his conquest in particular, is 
was he doing it just to be king of Westeros or was he responding to prophecy? Because so many of them are responding to prophecy. Um, it doesn't have to be sh just one or the other. And we know for a fact that there are certain Targaryens that were much more influenced by pursuing prophecy, but there probably are just as many that were not. Um, Rhaegar in particular is one of those that was after it. We know that Aerys the first is very involved, probably Baylor the Blessed. But um, if Aegon the Unworthy had some prophetic reason for doing what he was doing, I don't know what it was. Um, and when you're talking about characters like Aegon the Conqueror, he we we really aren't gonna know because I don't think George is ever gonna give us that time frame as other than the historical way we've seen it in um, Fire and Blood. That's probably going to be it. So if you want to try and find it in Fire and Blood, all right. I, I, I just don't know what it is. Um, I would be hesitant, though, to definitely assign that kind of motivation to Aegon based on what we know. It really is just so little. Basically a blank slate as a ruler. Um, so... Maybe, maybe pump the brakes a little bit, but it's certainly something to think about. And it's an interesting topic. Um, how, how many characters does this really affect? I mean, it may, I don't know. If you're even looking at... Um, so if you take Makar's children, you have Aemon, Egg, Daron, and you have Arian. How many of them were influenced by prophecy at some point? All four. How much it varies. Um, we know Aemon by the end of his life had spent a lot of time learning about it. Daron literally received dreams. Aegon probably got convinced by it. So I guess you could probably say for most of them some amount, but some took it very much seriously than others. Uh, didn't Gurm say in the interview that Aegon the first conquered because of a prophecy? If he did, I I don't remember seeing it. Um Yes, the book readers, the uh, those that read scrolls are definitely those most involved. Um, I would have, to, I don't remember seeing that from George, but if he did, that would certainly be more interesting. It'd make Aegon a more interesting character than he is. Um, so I think that's about it for today. Uh, it's about that's about it. So. I want to thank you all for coming out today. Again, any of you guys, if you feel like supporting me in the channel, just make sure you like and subscribe. Like that's really all that I ask from anybody. <clears throat> if you want to go above and beyond, there's also super chats and Patreon and stuff like that. Uh, get access to other things. And just a reminder, everyone that won us a thing today, make sure you send me a message and I will give you the code and instructions on how to use it. But yeah. Uh, Thanks so much for uh, stopping by, everybody. I hope everybody that celebrates Christmas has a great Christmas. And if not, you know, everybody have a happy holidays and make sure you get vaccinated.